Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, we were talking about exploration schemes and multi-arm bandit problems. Uh, and in the last week, or sorry, last class, we talked about the frequentist approach for exploration. And just to recap, the approaches were, sorry, empirical mean, plus some function of t and t i t. And then we studied empirical mean with some function of, uh, what were the other methods? Okay, so there was one with respect to plus standard gumbel. then empirical mean plus some function of t, tit multiplied by gumbel, and then uh, there was some index using dkl and empirical mean. So these were the four classes of algorithms we had studied. Um, and in this particular class of algorithms, we didn't make any assumption about the underlying distribution, okay? Today, we are going to talk about the Bayesian approach where we are going to put a lot of structure on the distribution that we are going to see for the reward function. And more importantly, we'll put some prior distribution, prior belief on the parameter set that defines those distributions. So, distributions parameterized by theta and we have some prior belief on theta 1 to theta n which lies in the space capital theta n. What's going to happen in today's class is we will look at how the belief is updated on the prior parameters. And we use that updated belief to come up with exploration schemes in multi-arm bandit. Okay, that's the goal for today. So in the same vein, we talked about maximum likelihood estimate in the previous class, so those, those are the two things that we need to know about before I proceed further. So in the maximum likelihood estimate, uh, the PDF is F theta X, no, X theta. Uh, we don't know the value of theta. We observe X1 to XT and we find an estimate of theta hat T by picking arg max of theta in capital theta of product i equals 1 to t f of xi theta. Okay, that's the maximum likelihood estimate 
I don't know the parameter theta. I observe some data coming out of the distribution. These are all IID data. So it's the time index. So this is the information. This is the data you've collected. And as you collect more and more data, so x1, x2, x3, x4, all the way to xt, so as you collect more and more data, your estimates become better and better. They are all IID. But of course, MLE is more. Um, you can come up with MLEs where these are not IID, okay? But it's just that it's not useful for bandit algorithms because there we assume everything is IID. So this is IID case. Okay, this is a well-studied uh, thing in statistics. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if you pick any statistics class, MLE is perhaps one of the first estimation algorithms you will talk about. Okay, so here we are not making any assumption on theta except that theta lies in this set, capital theta, okay? Now in maximum a poster posteriori estimate, this is known as M MAP, the thing has changed a little bit, so now we have a prior. I'm going to use pi to denote the prior. So theta is distributed according to pi, which is a probability distribution over theta. And then we have x1 to xt iid from the original distribution. And now the question is, as I look at the value of x1, what should I do? So what, what I can do is I can update my belief on theta. So let me start with uh, say pi zero and then pi one will be updated posterior belief belief on theta uh, based on x1 and more generally pi t will be updated posterior belief on theta based on x1 to xt. So how do I compute pi, pi 1 based on the value of x1 that I have observed? What can I do about it? So given theta, so theta is also a random variable here, but given theta, x1 to xt are iid and distributed in this particular fashion. And in, my, in this particular situation, I'm just making a small change from here. So the change is that now I have a prior over theta. I, I have a prior belief over theta. So if I have a reinforcement learning video and a cat video and I need to come up with some advertising campaign. You can definitely have a prior that the reinforcement learning video will not help you in advertising, whereas the cat video could help you in advertising, right? So that's the kind of thing, the prior encode. So you kind of know something about the underlying business or underlying reward structure that tells you that some thetas are more plausible, other thetas are less plausible, and therefore you encode that in your prior belief over theta. Okay, so now the question is, how do I compute pi one? Assume everything is finite, assume the simplest case without getting bogged down by difficult math. Any thoughts? Bayes rule, 
Bayesian approach, come on guys. <laughs> Session right there. Okay, so we'll apply Bayes rule. So, probability of theta given x1 is probability of x1 given theta multiplied by probability of theta over probability of x1 probability of x1. Uh, let's just given theta prime probability theta prime summation over all theta prime. You can take integral, you can take summation depending upon the situation. Okay. So this is the Bayes rule. Uh, you can put the posterior belief or prior belief here. This is the data you have observed. Uh, and then you average over all possible theta prime that you could possibly see and x1 coming out of that particular theta prime and then average it out in the denominator that gives you the posterior belief based on the information that you have actually seen until now. So this actually, you can think of it as a mapping. So pi 1, so this is my pi 1, this is my pi 0, this is my pi 0 right here and this is of course, uh, this term is coming from f of x1 theta or whatever probability distribution function you may have or probability mass function you may have which is something that we already know. We know x is coming from what kind of parameterized class. So this defines a mapping pi1 is equal to some function, well I'm not going to use f. I need an, oh I can use capital F capital F of x1 comma pi 0 and then pi 2 is capital F of x2 comma pi 1 and so on and so forth. That will be your update scheme. This is the posterior update scheme. And this is your mapping F. This is my f of x1 comma pi 0. Okay, so I got a distribution over theta but I want to have some theta hat t, what would I do? Any thoughts? This allows you to update the posteriors. So you define your theta hat t as arg max over theta in theta probability of theta given x1 to xt. That's the most plausible theta hat. So, sorry, that's the most plausible value of theta uh, that defines the true distribution. Right? So this gives you one way to estimate theta where you have a prior over theta. This gives you another way to estimate theta where you don't have a prior over theta, okay? So all you are assuming is that the random variables you are observing, the reward that you are observing is coming from a parameterized class and then you use maximum likelihood estimate to estimate the value of theta hat after observing t data points. Whereas in the case of having a prior, you have to apply Bayes rule again and again and then you have to uh, 
conduct an arg max at the end of it. So this is your pi t of theta given x1 to xt. This is your posterior belief right here. This is pi 1. You can define pi t analogously. Okay, any question on this? Very straightforward stuff. Um, again, both these things are very well studied in statistics uh, literature. Any book on 5000 level statistics course will have both these topics in them. And what we are going to do today is exploit these two ideas for multi arm banded problems. Okay. Let's start with, so what should I do? Maybe let's start with Thompson sampling. So Thompson sampling was uh, developed by Thompson, I think in 1933 or something like that, like very old paper. But it came into limelight in 2010, 2011 when some researchers from Yahoo research uh, wrote a paper about how cool Thompson sampling is for advertising business. And since then, of course, Thompson sampling has received a lot of attention, uh, particularly in the context of advertising. So you have Bernoulli arms. So your reward x i of t is 1 with probability theta 1. So, uh, sorry, theta i and 0 with probability 1 minus theta i. Now, theta i is the unknown parameter. This is known as a Bernoulli distribution. This is the reward, of course. Okay, so I'm going to put a prior on theta. So my theta i is distributed according to beta. Alpha i, beta i. We haven't used alpha i and beta i yet, right? Oh, uh, well, I think the context is clear, okay. <coughs> So this is a, this has a PDF, some constant times theta raised to alpha minus one or alpha i minus one, one minus theta raised to beta i minus one. So this constant is the normalizing constant and beta distribution is supported between zero and one. Let's think about it. You have n arms or n, uh, n objects that you want to ob advertise on the website. You can only put one advertisement. So you have to pick which advertisement you want to uh, put on the website. And then a user clicks on the advertisement, so you get a reward of one. The user doesn't click, you get a reward of zero. You want to identify what advertisement you want to put on the website, okay? Eventually, like asymptotically, you want to learn what's the best advertisement among all possible advertisements you may have at that particular point of time. So the rewards here are whether the user clicks or doesn't click on the website, on the advertisement. Now it turns out, it turns out that if you have a beta distribution for theta i, and you get rewards according to Bernoulli distribution, 
then the posterior belief is also going to be uh, a beta distributed random variable. Okay, so I want to call this phi zero. You know, I'm I'm uh, I have to perhaps index these variables with time because I need to make sure that they are priors. So let me put zero here to denote that it's your prior. And then at time t, you have perhaps observed um, so you have perhaps pulled certain arms. So OK. Let me write it this way. Alpha i t plus 1, beta i t plus 1 equals to alpha i t plus x i t beta i t plus x i 1 minus x i t. This is for i equals to i t. So the arm that was pulled at time t and it would remain the same for i not equal to i t. Okay, so at time t, let's say I pulled arm one, and I got a reward of one. So I'm going to bump up alpha alpha one by one, and I'm going to let beta one remain the same. Okay, I'm not going to make any change to beta one. On the other hand, if I did not pull arm two or arm three, I'm just going to let alpha i and beta i remain the same. Okay, I'm not going to make any changes to that. All right, so now I know the posterior. I have a posterior belief on the value of theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, because all of them are distributed according to beta of alpha i, beta i, evaluated at t plus 1. And of course, this depends on all the rewards you have received from different arms um, over a period of time. Now, what does Thomson sampling do? What do you think Thomson sampling would do? Okay. Pulls the arm with maximum probability of theta i. Okay, that's a good starting point. According to the, the yeah, posterior, I yeah. Pull, I pull the arm that gives one with highest probability. Okay. So his idea is I'll pull the arm that gives me the highest probability of getting a reward. But I, unfortunately, I don't have the value of theta i. So I can only figure out which will give me maximum reward if I knew the value theta i. But all I have is a distribution over theta i. So it would be like probability. So you will take the average of theta i? Is that what you're planning to do? So you have a distribution over theta i, okay? Not theta i itself. So if you have a distribution, then, sorry? Take the mode of the distribution. Take the mean, so maybe you are saying take the mean of the distribution, you are saying take the mode of the distribution, but your earlier answer was correct. So you sample from this posterior distribution. 
Okay, so you've sampled theta i t from beta alpha i t beta i t and then you pull the arm i t equals to arg max of theta i t i equals 1 to n. So this is an index policy. Okay, so that's the idea of Thomson sampling. Uh, one of the reasons why Thomson sampling is really a good um, exploration scheme is because the computational overhead is almost negligible. Okay, so what's the computational overhead in computing the optimal arm? Um, updating the posterior, so for each arm, you have two parameters, alpha i and beta i. And then you look at your reward that you have received, and then you just update alpha and beta in an appropriate fashion. Okay? And then you just need to generate n random numbers at that, according to beta distribution at time t. So there is uh, some addition at every time, and there is some sampling according to beta distribution at every point of time. Okay? And then an arg max, of course. So Pretty much everyone looks for index policy because it's very easy to understand index policy. So, so that's the Thomson sampling scheme. Um, one uh, thing that people have noticed over the last 10 or so years is that Thomson sampling outperforms UCB algorithm in terms of exploration. But of course, it requires you to have a prior belief. If you don't have a prior belief, then and that becomes a problem. But if you have a prior belief, particularly if you have a Bernoulli uh, random variable or rewards coming from a Bernoulli distribution, you can come up with any prior, uniform prior, make it alpha 1 equals to 1 and beta 1 equals to 1. Just start with that and then keep updating alpha 1 and beta 1 and go through this algorithm. OK. So that's a. Uh, uh, that's the Thomson sampling approach. Now, of course, you can extend it to arbitrary distributions in this way. You sample theta i t according to the posterior at time t, and your index nu i of t is going to be the mean of well, I shouldn't say theta i t, but the distribution that is characterized by theta i t. So let's say I should write f of x theta i t. So this is the distribution function um, if you pick theta i t as the parameter. So instead of, uh, so what you do is you use the posterior distribution to sample a theta i t. And then you use that theta i2 to compute the mean of that distribution and then use that as an index to compute the arm to play at that particular point of time. Okay. So in this situation, the complexity is, of course, significant in comparison to UCB because you need to do a sampling from a posterior. Computation of posterior could be a very complicated expression. So this f may not be that easy to compute. Nonetheless, there are quite a few algorithms, uh, randomized algorithms to do posterior sampling, and then another set of algorithms to compute the mean of certain distributions. So perhaps you can use those 
computational tools to do it for more general arms. But naturally, Thomson sampling is more popular for situations where you have Bernoulli rewards and you have uh, priors according to beta distribution, because those are easy to implement. So this is the mean. This is the mean reward that you get according to theta s. It's the same, same algorithm, no difference. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, let's move on. The next algorithm is Bayes UZB. So, so you have posteriors pi one t pi n t until time t, which is based on all the data you have seen so far. Let F i t, oh, I perhaps need to put t in the, I want to define the CDF for these posteriors. So, pi i t has CDF F i t uh, let me put x here. Let QIT P be defined as inf X in R such that P is less than FIT X. This is known as quantile function. And then based on this, oh, uh, I hope you're not confused between theta and Q. Let me make the Q very big. Okay, so this is your quantile function. And then my index is QIT 1 minus 1 over T log T raised to C. So remember that the end of the horizon is needed for this particular problem. <coughs> oh, this is also for Bernoulli distribution with Bernoulli rewards and beta prior. So we need to know the end of the horizon for this particular algorithm. And C is, of course, some tunable parameter. Uh, I think the authors suggest to take C equals to 5 or C equals to 0. And as far as the regret is concerned, the theorem is epsilon greater than zero, i 
not optimal and c is equal to 5 implies expected value of t i t is less than equal to 1 plus epsilon over This is small o. What is small? small o means that this term goes to zero as log t goes to infinity. Okay, so in comparison to this term, this term is very, very small. Okay, in comparison to this term, this term is very small. So O log t over log t goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So what do you think about this algorithm for Bernoulli rewards? What did Lyon Robin say about such an uh, such a multi arm bandit problem? Anyone remembers? So Lyon Robin's result was that the expected value of TIT will always be greater than or equal to one over DKL theta i theta star log t. Okay? So up to an epsilon factor here and perhaps some small number here, which perhaps doesn't matter in long run, um, they're able to achieve the optimal bound, okay? The optimal regret, not the optimal regret bound, but the lower, the lower bound is provided by Lie and Robbins and this one is able to meet the bound uh, for all time steps t. So this, this holds for all time steps t, capital T. Remember that Lie and Robbins result was asymptotic in nature. Okay, so as t goes to infinity, they gave the regret bound. But this one proves that this is true for all t. Theta star would be the optimal, um, optimal arm, the theta corresponding to the optimal arm for this particular problem. Yes, 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 yes. Very similar. So the only difference would be like this function. Correct. The quant yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um yeah, in which case it need not be a finite horizon process, yeah. If C is equal yeah, so that's what the authors write that you we have done the simulation with C equals to zero and it still works very well. So but they prove all the results with c equals to 5. Okay. Any other question? So the recurring theme in all these algorithms is you have a prior on theta i, which was not the case with UCB types algorithm. Yes. Um, you know they so I their proofs are pretty long and complicated. So the dependence why they came up with c equals to five is kind of unclear by looking at their proof. Like you have to deeply study the proof in order to figure out why c equals to five makes sense. But of course, once you prove the result, then you forget about what parameter it is. Just do some simulation with c equals to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then say, look, c equals to 0 seems to be doing well. Okay, so that's the, that's a very usual thing to do in this area.
The third algorithm I'm going to talk about is information directed sampling. So I need to introduce some notation. So bear with me. How many of you are familiar with the notion of mutual information? Mutual information, okay. So let's say I have two random variables, x and y. And I want to and they have distribution uh, p x y. So p x y is the joint distribution. P x is marginal on x. P y is the marginal on y. So p x of x is equal to summation p x y x comma y and y is in the set of all possible y's. So that's the marginal and px is the marginal on x and py is the marginal on y. Okay, so we define entropy of the distribution p, so this is h of px. So H is used to denote entropy of a probability distribution. And this is given by summation minus PXX log PXX, X is in capital X. That's the entropy. What does entropy tell us? So those of you who haven't seen entropy before, try to compute the entropy of a uniformly distributed random variable, okay? And try to compute entropy of a deterministic variable, okay? So let's, let's try and do that. So let's say my x was 0, 1 and my px half, half. Okay, so the probability of 0 is half, probability of 1 is half. Okay, so that's a uniformly distributed random variable. What is h of px? Anyone wants to give it a shot? Especially those who have not seen entropy before. Okay, let's compute this. So this is minus one over two, log one over two, minus one over two, log one over two that's equal to log 2, right? Uh, let's pick px equals to 1, 0. So that's a deterministic random variable. So it means that 0 with probability 1, 1 with probability 0. h of px is 1 log 1 minus 0 log 0 and this is equal to 0. So if we know a random variable exactly, which means it's not a random variable anymore, it's actually a deterministic variable, 
then the entropy is equal to zero. Whereas if I have absolute uncertainty about the random variable, which means any one of them could be true with probability half, then its entropy is a positive number. So what does that suggest? Entropy is measuring the inherent randomness in that random variable. The more random a variable is, the higher the entropy is. The less random a variable is, the lower the entropy is. Okay. Okay. So connected with this notion of entropy is the notion of mutual information. denoted by i. So I'm using i for both uh, information structure as well as mutual information. So let me use a different i. i x, y. And this is given by, so this is mutual information between two random variables x and y. And this is the KL divergence between the joint distribution and the product of marginals. This is joint. This is product of marginals. So if x and y are independent, the mutual information is 0. If x and y are dependent, then the mutual information is positive. The more dependent x and y are, the higher the mutual information is. Okay? So mutual information encodes the dependence between the two random variables x and y. Okay? All right. So let me actually write it. So high mutual information implies uh, high correlation. Low mutual information implies low dependence. Low, I shouldn't write correlation, high dependence. Low dependence. So x and y could be, if x and y are independent, then the mutual information is zero. All right, so that's uh, information theory 101. Now, here is the idea. I've been to Kroger, I've been to Whole Foods, I've been to Giant Eagle several times. And I have some prior on which one is good and based on my experiences so far, I have updated those priors and so I have a posterior belief on which grocery store is good for me, okay? I have to decide which grocery store I should go to and there are two competing objectives. Should I exploit the information I've received so far or should I explore a different grocery store. So let's say Whole Foods is the one that I like the most. But should I explore Kroger today or should I explore Giant Eagle today? Or should I exploit the information that I have received over the past several years 
that whole food seems to be good so let's go to whole foods today okay these are the two objectives that i'm trying to balance so the idea of information directed sampling is i'm going to create a metric for every policy that i can possibly pick okay so mu is my policy so for po for a policy that i'm going to pick i'm going to have a metric which is going to somehow balance these two objectives so i want to pick an arm which is going to get me closer to the optimal arm but at the same time i want to balance the expected reward i am going to get out of it okay so let's define two other functions so gt so uh, let's say pi 1t pi nt these are the posteriors on theta 1 to theta n I'm going to define the information gain GT of I as mutual information between I star, which is the optimal arm, and XTI which is the reward that I'm going to receive from picking arm i at time t. This is the optimal arm. This is the reward from arm i at time t. That's the information gain term. And I'm going to write the reward or maybe regret, uh, instantaneous regret, instantaneous regret is expected value Um, I somehow want to write the dependence with the information that I've had so far so that GT explains that, but uh, let me condition it on the information I've received so far. Okay, so this is all the information that I've received so far. So the distributions of all these variables are appropriately uh, measured based on the information that I've seen so far. And the instantaneous regret is XTI star minus XTI given IT. on the optimal arm that you don't know about. So, but based on the current information, you have a belief on what is the optimal arm. So that's not the true, I think there is one optimal arm. There's of course one optimal arm, but, uh, but you don't know what that arm is, but you had some priors on the distributions of each arm. And based on the current information, you have some prior, some posterior on what the optimal arm is. So what's the probability that arm one is optimal? What's the probability that arm two is optimal? What's the probability that arm three is optimal and so on? And then you also have the distribution of the reward, which of course depends on the value of theta one, theta two, theta three, and all that. I, I mean, I'm not saying that this is an easy to compute quantity. It's a very complicated quantity, but this is 
what information direct sampling does. <coughs> Sorry? You mean also, uh, I star is also yes, so I star, which is the optimal arm, is also a distribution uh, which depends on what information you have accrued so far. Okay, so there is a distribution. This is a random variable. This is a random variable. You are taking the mutual information between these two random variables given the current information that you have. And the same thing here. Taking the expected value of the reward that you could get from the optimal arm minus the reward you could get from arm i given the current information that you have. So how can I lose the optimal arm from previous observations? I just right. You, you will not know the optimal arm, but you have some distribution over what is the, so you have some, so what's the, you have some probability that i star is equal to 1 is some probability phi 1, I, well, I have to condition it on the information. and so on. So these problems are computed, right? Yeah, these are computed based on the posterior beliefs that you have. So think about the Bernoulli case, right? So you're updating your theta 1, theta 2 um, parameters. And in that case, theta 1 is the mean value of that distribution. So what's the probability that theta 1 is greater than theta 2? given the information that you have. What's the probability that theta 2 is greater than theta 1 given the information that you have? And that's P1 and P2, okay? All right. I'm going to extend these two definitions to a policy that I'm going to pick. So I'm going to define. So mu is a. Uh, just a policy at time t is summation of mu i g t i i equals 1 to n and the same thing for okay What do I want to minimize and what do I want to maximize here? Okay, so let's let's look at these two terms. I want to pick an arm i that gets me closer to i star. Okay, remember our goal is to minimize the mutual information. So if uh, you want to have low mutual information, which implies that there is low dependence between the two. Am I right? I think so, yeah. So you want to maximize the mutual information. Yeah, you want to maximize the mutual information uh, so that you pick an arm i, which will get you closer to the optimal arm, okay? But at the same time, you want your instantaneous regret to be as low as possible because you don't want to spend too much money on just exploration. So there are two competing objectives. You want this to be high. You want this to be low. So you want this to be low. You want this to be high. What would you do? You have to pick a policy mu at this point of time based on this function gt of mu and this function delta t of mu. You have a question? No. Yeah. Uh, you just want to know what is the optimal arm. You don't care the distribution of the reward of the optimal arm. So remember, what you care about is the mean of the reward, not the reward itself. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Right? So this somehow encapsulates that information. You want to know what the optimal arm is, which has the highest mean. You don't particularly care what the distribution is. 
How would you do that? Okay. Uh, without, if you don't know the distribution, how do you know the mean? So if you have a lot of data, of course, you can average it out and you have a good estimate of the mean, even if you don't know what the distribution is. Uh, but the average, like the, having a lot of data means exploring. Uh, that's right. So you have, so having a lot of data means you perhaps, no. Well, having a lot of data doesn't mean you have explored much. So let's say you come to Columbus on day zero, and all the way up to day 500, you have only gone to Kroger and you have not gone to Whole Foods or Giant Eagle. Then that means that you have a lot of data for 500 days, but all that data is for Kroger, not for other stores. So you perhaps have not explored enough. I mean, in this case, you have not explored at all. You've just gone to one place. and stuck to it, okay? So the goal of information-directed sampling is to somehow balance these two competing objectives, which is I want to gain more information about the optimal arm, but at the same time, I don't want to pay too much for in terms of regret or in terms of cost. What would you do if you were faced with this objective of finding mu? So the goal is find mu that balances the two objectives. Okay, so you want mu T star to be arg max of what? Gt over well okay Gt mu over oh uh, I'm not able to understand. Do you want to write it on the board? <laughs> yeah. Oh, one over delta t. Okay. Okay. All right. So he has. Okay, that's good. So you want g t of mu plus one over delta t of mu. Okay. Uh, sounds reasonable, yes. Okay, so, okay, good. So there is another option, gt mu minus delta t mu. Okay, you guys are generating algorithms like there is no tomorrow. Uh, anything else? Okay. <laughs> All right, so introduce weight. So you have W1 GT mu minus W2 delta T mu. Okay, anything else? Okay, you can come up with uh, many possible ways of computing mu T star. So the IDS algorithm, information directed sampling algorithm, it picks mu T star to be the argument over all mu of delta T mu square over gt mu. Now, of course, uh, uh, I'm not saying that that index is easy to, not index, well, it's not an index, it directly gives you the policy, but the 
this is not easy to compute very difficult to compute but again achieves much better performance in terms of regret uh, for many standard bandit algorithms yeah no this is a convex function of mu okay but the the difficulty is in computing delta t and gt Like the new that minimizes the regret will minimize GTU. Uh -huh. how, come, how come this happened? So, if you minimize this, then what do you what? So, uh, this is the way to minimize the regret. Mm -hmm. Why this policy will minimize as well the GT of mu? So it's not minimizing; it's one over GT of mu. So it's. Yes. That we like to minimize the regret or right. minimize this delta t new. Correct. And mi maximize this. So, so you want maximize information gain and minimize the regret. Why they are contradicting each other? Oh, because uh, it, let's say you, you, you have gone to Kroger several times and you've not gone to Whole Foods. But maybe if you go to Whole Foods, you will have a much higher regret. You don't know. So you will pay in terms of regret. There is a possibility of you paying in terms of regret if you start exploring. So that possibility is what you want to minimize based on all the information you have collected so far. OK. Yes. Yes. So remember, in so for the UCB algorithms, you don't need any information about the environment, OK? But for these kind of algorithms, you need to have prior over theta. If you don't have prior over theta, you cannot have posteriors over theta. If you don't have posteriors over theta, none of this can be computed. So we have to pay first? No, you have to have a distribution over the parameters that defines the distribution of the rewards. A lot of distribution. <laughs> No, you, you do exploration in both situations, right? So remember in the previous class, we talked about UCB type algorithms. It also included exploration terms where you added, you bumped up the mean by some factor in order to explore arms that have not been explored enough, OK? We are doing the same thing here, but we now have post priors on theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, all the way up to theta n. Every time we receive a information, a new information, we update those priors so we get posteriors. We use those posteriors to compute the information gain. We use that to compute instantaneous regret. Then we do the argument, and then we get the policy with which we need to act at that particular point of time. So it's just a very different way of looking at the same problem, but it requires more knowledge than what was required of in the previous set of algorithms we talked about. OK, the regret, which is kind of surprising, theoretical regret is order of square root of t. That's the theoretical regret proven in the paper by uh, Russo and Van Van Roy in uh, 2017. Uh, so the regret bound is disappointing, but the performance is uh, very, very good. OK, so that's an open problem to close the gap. So performance better than UCB and some other algorithms. Any question? Okay. This is again a general purpose algorithm. So remember, throughout the description, we have not made any assumption on the 
for instance, Bernoulli assumption or beta assumption on the prior and so on and so forth. We have not made any of those assumptions here. So this algorithm can be applied more generally. So no matter what kind of bandit algorithm you have, as long as you can compute the posteriors and compute all these uh, uh, values, you can run IDS on that particular example. Okay, now, so this is 2017. 2014 to 2017. So 2014 was the conference paper, 2017 was the journal paper. So the reviewers must have been very harsh on the authors. Okay, that's why it took three years to publish. Uh, but anyway, so this, this algorithm is from the 2017 paper. Okay, the next algorithm is biased maximum likelihood estimate. BMLE algorithm. Biased maximum likelihood estimation algorithm. Um, this is from July 2019. Okay, so this is like very fresh. OK, so I'm going to assume xit Bernoulli theta i, uh, no assumption, no assumptions on prior, on theta i. So basically, I, I'm not endowing theta i with any prior distribution. So Therefore, I'm in the maximum likelihood estimation domain, not in the opposed MAP domain. So in this case, my I want to talk about the likelihood function. So L Okay, so let's Let's do this. Let's say SIT is equal to number of times uh, XI, XIL was equal to 1 from 1 less than equal to L less than equal to T, or maybe strictly less than T. So SIT is the number of times I've had success in the past, or number of times people have clicked on the ad. Uh, TIT, of course, you know, number of times I was played. So the likelihood function, uh, so F of X theta or XI theta I, is basically anyone remembers what the Bernoulli distribution PDF of Bernoulli distribution is? It should be easy. Okay, I didn't seem to write the likelihood function here. But let me, uh, I, I don't have the expression for the likelihood function, so perhaps I can update you on that over email. But the idea here is I want to pick theta hat t to be arg max of m in 0, 1 raised to n, the likelihood function L of the vector m given i t multiplied by max over i m i raised to alpha t. 
Now alpha t satisfies some assumption, so alpha t goes to infinity, alpha t over t goes to 0. This is the likelihood function, so I am blanking out on the expression for the likelihood function. So given all the information you have, you will construct the likelihood function for all the bandits. So it takes a vector of means. And then you pick max over i mi, uh, raise it to alpha t. So this is the bias part. Remember in the, in the maximum likelihood estimate, what did you do? Well, you didn't have this particular term. You only had the maximum of likelihood function. Um, but now, you have the bias, so this is the bias part. This is the bias that you add. You multiply to the likelihood function. That gives you biased maximum likelihood estimate. So this is the biased maximum likelihood estimate. And then this is, of course, a vector in Rn, or maybe 0, 1 raised to n. And then the idea is your mu t of i t will be arg max of theta hat t i, i equals 1 to n. So that's your policy. Now, of course, uh, this looks like a pretty horrible expression, but actually, I can compute theta hat ti somewhat easily based on the data that I have. So theta hat ti is given by the following long expression. That's the index. Their suggestion is to use alpha t equals to log t raised to 1.5. Can someone guess what's the result for the regret? I mean, empirical result, not theoretical one. Well, this outperformed all the other exploration schemes for multi-armed bandit. 
that's their empirical result okay so theoretically the regret is regret of mu t is c1 log t plus c2 alpha t alpha capital t plus c3 c1 c2 c3 are some constants so it has a log t term it has an alpha t term so alpha t is of course log t raised to 1.5 and then they have a c3 term but their claim to fame is that they outperform on uh, they are much better in terms of regret uh, for of course bernoulli case as well as for the gaussian case with respect to all the exploration schemes that we have seen so far okay plus the index is very easy to compute okay and they don't need any prior on theta so no prior on theta index is easy to compute okay involve some multiplication and some uh, logarithmic terms not a problem uh, regret bound is whatever it is but empirical performance is far superior than the regret bound okay so that's all i have for exploration schemes in multi arm bandits in the next class we are going to extend the ucb algorithm to general reinforcement learning problem where you have a state you have action you have reward and you have a state transition function okay so we'll see that on tuesday of next week thank you yeah 1.5 1.5